Nobody has like a feeling on accident. There's always a reason why. Um, there's always a reason why people feel certain things. So, r- kind of related to that is, <clears throat> I'm taking a look again at like Christianity or other broad ideas or whatever. And something that I used to do is, if I felt like you're, we'll say when I say epistemology or epistemic, I'm talking about the way that you figure out like what is real or true essentially right if things have like a bad epistemic base like if they figure like oh well this is true because i have faith in god or whatever um prior to that i would just write it off i'd say this is a waste of time like there's nothing of value that i can get from you if you're gonna start from this foundation um but something that i'm trying to do now instead is like if there are these other coherent systems or internally coherent systems of thought um, then what I'm trying to do is, well, if you think this, like, what are you mapping onto in the real world? Because a, a, a foolish statement might be that like religion is real, but I think a more foolish statement would be religion is completely false. Like there's no way that everything is incoherent babble. So many people follow it. So many people believe in it. There's obviously something there that's working right? Something, something has to be working. So all I'm trying to do now, I guess, is like, look at other systems of thought and then say like, well, what is comparable to, to, or, or how does this map onto like the real world? Like what, what experiences are these mapping onto? And then once I get like the mapping, then maybe there's something of value that's being said that I wouldn't be able to get from my point of view, right? So an example of this would be something that I was talking about earlier where um, when I think about ethics, um, when I think about ethics, if, if I'm thinking, somebody got mad for, for characterizing these as three normative ethical systems. Like the, the only normative ethical systems I know of are, you've got deontology, which is kind of like talking about like the, the virtue of like an individual action, like is something good or you're using people or whatever, like as a means to an end. Like you, you've got deontology, you've got consequentialism, which is looking at like outcomes of things, right? Like, well, what are the actions we need to take just to create the best outcomes? And then you've got virtue ethics. And virtue ethics are always the things that I made fun of because it's like, you try to be virtuous. I don't know, try to uh, aspire to live up to some virtue. Um, oh, that's the other threat, nice. That something I'm at. It. Um, let me just actually, let's just read real quick that because <laughs> this just always seemed weirdly incoherent to me. Virtue ethics is currently one of the three major approaches in normative ethics. It may initially be identified as the one that emphasizes the virtues or moral character, in contrast to the approach that emphasizes duties or rules, deontology, or that emphasizes the consequences of actions, consequential. So those are the other two I'm talking about. Suppose it is obvious that someone in need should be helped. A utilitarian will point to the fact that the consequences of doing so will maximize well-being. A deontologist to to the fact that in doing so, the agent will be acting in accordance with a moral rule, such as doing to others as you would uh, be done by, and a virtue ethicist to the fact that helping that person would be charitable or benevolent. That's not to say that the only virtue ethicists, that only virtue ethicists attend to virtues any more than it is to say that only consequentialists attend to consequences or only deontologists to rules. Each of the above mentioned approaches can make room for virtues, blah, 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 blah. Um, regardless, are you talking about things like how all the shit you can't eat in Leviticus was probably shit that was not safe to eat at the time? Like if we don't believe in God and they say there are rules that came from God, we should be able to find somewhere in the world these rules actually kind of, more, yeah, something maybe. I'm not really looking at the theological part as much. I don't care about that right now. Um, I guess what I've been looking at for my own self and then into the world around me for the people I intersect with are um, are like these ideas of, um, of like character. Like what does character come from? What does it mean to have good character? Um, so one of the things I completely stole this analogy earlier when I was talking about how to act in a virtuous way or act in accordance with some virtue, um, I've always felt like, so here's something I've said in the past, and this is kind of like my secular engagement with it, right? When people say the ends justify the means, I don't think that's usually a good statement because oftentimes with those ends, you're sneaking in something that you don't know. So for instance, let's say um, there's somebody that we can kill and if we kill them, you know, we'll save like three lives, right? Well, do the ends justify the means? 
like, yeah, we should kill this person and save these three people, right? So that's like, the ends justify the means, sure. And you think that what your means are is killing a person and your ends are saving three people. But there's another statement that gets smuggled in to that end. And the statement is, it's okay to kill one person to save three people. You've now amended like what those ends are. You, and people don't realize that. That when you start making compromises like that, you're changing the rules in ways that you don't realize. So that's how I would explain that before. So um, a different take on this that I thought was interesting is uh, from a Christian perspective, I say Christian, I think C.S. Lewis would count as a Christian author. He's not like a theologian, but from his perspective, the way that he describes it is you have an internal kind of like a character, we'll say like a statue or something. And you can either act in accordance with Christian virtues, or you can act in, in discord. You can act opposite to those or with selfishness, greed, you know, whatever sin you choose to practice. And every time you act in a certain direction, every time you act in a certain way, you're chiseling at your character and you're carving and creating something that will resemble whatever action you're taking. So say you were to act in accordance with a certain virtue over and over and over and over and over again. Um, after some time, you're, you're chiseling like a type of character or statue that will be somebody that can act in accordance with that virtue more in the future, somebody that resembles it, has a character that is in accordance with the, the way that you want to be. Does that make sense? Whereas if you are, um, whereas if you are acting in discord, um, I don't know if discordance is a word, but if you're acting opposite to that, if you're embodying some sin or whatever, you're chiseling like a different type of statue is basically what I'm saying. Um, so yeah, so I so that's just so that's like um, I don't I don't believe in internal statues or I don't believe in um, that character exists in some spiritual realm or whatever. But like that analogy, I think kind of works in terms of how I would want people to function because when you act in certain ways, it's not just an action that you do in the external world. It has an internal carving on your character. The capital C, like who you are, it affects you. It leaves a mark on you. Every action that you do towards another person. Um, yeah. I don't know if... I find it hard to listen to people talk about character or building character. And that's something that I've been more interested in. But I don't know. Um, was Taylor Swift touring? Why was she flying so much? Can the prevalence of religion just be explained by how effective placebo is in the same way that we see so many people go to acupuncture, massage therapy, all that shit? Yeah, maybe. It could be. Who knows? Yeah, maybe it's all a big meme. <clears throat> Sperm, Sperg, Mal, Mal, Sperg, Mamel. Nice name, dude. Her publicist says she's a rent gents to others. Nice. A little bit, Brandon. Holy shit, YouTube chat got some cool emotes. There's like one dude that emails me all that stuff. I wish I could remember his name because you guys technically owe him all of your emails or all of your emotes. The problem that I've always run into is that most people talk about character, bundle in a lot of personal bias and preference into what they talk about, like hating people who do drugs or have sex long ago. Yeah, I know, but that's like, this is always the problem is like people will scare you away from the ideologies, right? You, you have to get past the people and you have to look to the teachings or the, 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 the system of whatever it is you want to analyze, right? I, I think that this is a huge problem in life. Like Christianity's worst enemy are, are Christians and the way that they act, right? Because it's easy to look at the actions of a lot of Christians, especially in the United States and say, wow, what a dog shit religion, right? Um, but I mean, like you run into that same problem with so many other things too. Look at, uh, like progressives, you know, like who are progressives worse than me sometimes it's other progressives, right. Or even conservatives under Trump, like, like some conservatives were their own worst enemies as well. Um, people tend to judge the tenets by the, those that claim that they adhere to them, even if they don't. And, um, yeah, I don't know. That's a, it's a problem.
What about how we think we are the universe? People like Glink sound like it. Glink is insane. It's not, yeah. Why Christian virtues versus any religious virtues? I don't know. Maybe I'll read other things. Right now, the only shit being recommended to me is Christian shit. Maybe I'll read something different in the future. Um, Christianity is easy for me to understand because it's my, I have a huge background in Catholicism. So I, it's not like I'm learning a whole bunch of new shit for the first time. I'm just kind of like recontextualizing it now as an adult when I learned about it as a child. I'm sure that half the videos I watch from progressives are psyops. There's just no way. Yeah, maybe. Destiny converts to Islam. I'd be so excited. My, this is like a feeling I have, and it's it's by knowing a lot about Christianity and very little about Islam and not as much about Judaism, but it feels to me like if you are a spiritual tenet of any of the three major monotheistic religions, you're probably living a pretty similar life. That's what it feels like. If you adhere spiritually to like the main pillars of Islam, the main teachings of in the Torah, or you know whatever it says in the Gospel, like it seems like if you're like your lives should look pretty similar in, in, in the more important ways, I would imagine. Um, that's what it feels like, but. <clears throat> Don't really agree with that. The community aspect of Islam diverges in many ways from compared to Christian identity. Maybe, who knows? But like I said, I don't know much about it. <laughs> Jesus. Oh my God. How do you feel about dating coworkers? I work in surgery and crushing hard on another surgical tech. I'm 25. How do you feel about dating coworkers? I work in surgery and crushing hard on another surgical tech. I'm 25 and she's 21 BTW. You are, um, what, your name is gay for big boys. Why are you crushing on a girl? Um, people always date in their coworkers. I don't know, dude. Good luck. Like, everybody does it. Go for it. Good luck. And then at the end of the day, <laughs> stay away from women because they're toxic. What does your music theory brain say about this? Isn't there a genre of music called, like, noise? Is that it? Is this it? I have no idea. Allah, sister Mini. I catch her, she loves the Adhan, mashallah. She is listening to the call for prayer. Now we will pray to God. She wants to unplug. Unplug is very haram. Don't unplug. Don't unplug. Mashallah, sister Mini. I catch. Last year I turned to Buddhism. Previously, I had never cared about tradition, but when I look, when I now look at stuff like offerings to the Buddha as a means of tying a physical act with the cultivation of generosity, it makes a lot more sense. I'm feeling more and more. I I I, I feel this. It took me a long time to learn this. Um, there might be like a deeper neuro, like chemical or neurophysical or neurophysiological connection to events or something. Like, I'm sure there's a way to explain this scientifically, but um. I think that it's a mistake to make everything immediately available to a human. 
I think that tying certain actions or rituals to certain events, I think is a an immensely positive and like spiritually enriching experience. I wish I had a better word for spiritually, but there are like there are aspects to it that are like I think indescribable to things. Um, explain, yeah, like there's some people will fight on this. I wonder if it's an age thing. I have to check. Some people will fight on this. I'm assuming it's like younger people, and I think other people will not fight on this. So a really good example is watching movies. There is something so convenient and nice about being able to download a movie, watch it on my monitor, maybe even play a game on another monitor while I'm watching a movie. What a convenient and nice and fun experience, you know? But there's something magical about, I don't know why or how to explain it, but there is the, there's the moment when the lights turn off, the intro is done, and you hear like some people drinking, eating their popcorn, like right before the movie starts and the whole theater is silent before the opening of any film. And there are moments like these that you have to kind of work for. You have to drive somewhere, you've got to buy shit, you gotta find a seat. You have to go through these types of things. But like that ritual is like a, it's a special feeling that is lost when things become too convenient. <clears throat> another thing that I compare this to um, if you think that take is cringe because you don't like going to movies or whatever um, one thing that almost everybody will agree with is something is like lost when you buy a game on Steam there is there's something that was so magical and special about driving to the store going to the case sometimes having to ask somebody to unlock it so you can take out the box that has the pictures on the back. You ring it up, you buy it, it's in the bag. You have to wait till you get in the car to open it. You open the box. Before you even take out the game, you've got the book that you're looking through. Maybe you're reading it by the um, passing street lights. The car is going down the street. You get home, like you put in the cartridge, you sit in front of it. Like there's that whole experience. The before you ever even play the game, there is like there is a there is something that's like indescribably awesome about the the experience of getting there, the ritual, I guess. Um, Kellen of Kells is now a tier four sub. Nice. And they said, if you watched Kingdom of Heaven by Spielberg, the director's cut is pretty good and goes into some of this. I have not seen it. Um, isn't that just nostalgia? No, I don't think it's nostalgia. I think there's like, I don't know what it is, but there's something to be said for, I think these types of like, ritualistic experiences and when we um when we shortcut we shortcut so many things through life i think that we start to become like these dopamine machines that are missing out on like some other type of like life enrichment i think is really bad but destiny you're just describing being young um absolutely not that's not true because there still are some physical tactile experiences like that that i get Unboxing a new cell phone is like a fun experience. When you've got like a new tech piece or whatever, that's a super fun experience. Um, although not as fun as the game stuff because they had like books and like everything was right. It's like it's a fun thing to do. Um, going to theaters is still for me a really fun experience. I really enjoy that that ritual, or whatever. But You said that about porn too? Um, probably to some extent, yeah. I mean, I don't think necessarily think porn is bad, but you should watch the full length pornographic movie if you wanna watch, <laughs> I don't know. You got the most like physical face I have ever seen in my life. Like your face strong as fuck. You nigga. Ah! Man, the fuck is wrong with you nigga? Don't, man, I'm finna. How do you think people can prevent giving into gratification? It's just so addicting. Um, 
I, I don't know. That's a whole other type of thing. Like, I think you need to, um, I think society, I don't think humans can make those choices. I think society needs to kind of be built around it. We need to be more conscientious of it um, when we're constructing certain types of societies. Because if you give people like infinite access to like the pleasure buttons, like they're just going to push them until they die. What are you getting to though? Do you want a religious... Do you want a religious atheist church or do you want people to become Christian? I'm no, I didn't get any of that. I'm just sharing random fucking thoughts. It's a fucking YouTube stream, dude. I'm not trying to start a church over here. Isn't destiny describing a dopamine rush just in another form? It's again, it's I don't know how to explain it, but it's it's there's something different about like it's people are seeing delayed gratification, but it's not delayed gratification. Delayed gratification implies the same gratification just a bit later. There's like more enriching experiences depending on how you engage with stuff. Like one thing that I'll say, if you, I, hopefully we've all read at least one book, right? Like there is a magical special feeling. You could spend eight hours browsing memes and getting dopamine hits all day long. And you're not gonna remember a single one of those memes like the next day. You just, you'll do it for eight hours and you're done with it. Whereas like, there is an experience when you finish reading the final sentence on the final page of a really big fantasy book and you close the book. Like that is like a, that moment in time is a very, very, very special experience you built towards. And it's a different feeling than just like, oh cool, I just had a delayed dopamine hit, like a delayed gratification, you know? It's a different type of thing. I reckon your book examples the same with TV shows and stuff like that. Um, is it the same with TV shows and stuff like that? Yeah, it could be. There is like, there's two different ways to engage with certain types of media. Um, I think you can engage, there's probably a lot of different ways to engage with media, but I feel like you can engage passively with media and I feel like you can engage actively with media. Um, some forms of media lend themselves better to active engagement versus other forms of media that lend themselves to passive engagement. So for example, like reality TV tends to be a more passive engagement thing, right? You watch it, you're just kind of like, uh, and it's fun. It's cool. It's cool. It's like browsing memes on Reddit, basically. It's like reality TV. There's not really much to think about. Like it's feeding you like drama and predictable story arcs like every two minutes so that you can get it, scene switch, everything's good. Boom, 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 boom. The right sound effects tell me how to feel. The right editing and cuts tell me how I'm supposed to feel. Like the dialogue is all pretty predictable. The feel goods are predictable. Like everything works, you know? Um, Whereas if you have like, um, whereas some things take a little bit longer to digest, maybe require you to think about them a little bit more and they feel better when you, hopefully when you get to the end of it, yeah. Oh, maybe. In some ways it's nice to be able to, um, like an anime that's fully out that you can binge watch is really cool. Cause you get to just sit down, watch it all. You don't have to wait, that's awesome, right? That's a cool experience, kind of. It's nice to be able to do that. But there is also like something really magical about the weekly buildup to like the big cultural event and having that experience as well, right? Like every week when people are gathering into the chat room talking about the upcoming Game of Thrones episode, the upcoming, remember when we all watched the finale, the, the last few episodes of like Breaking Bad and shit, like Breaking Bad and Game of Thrones in my life, I think were peak experiences. There was nothing like Game of Thrones. I think Breaking Bad, it probably wasn't close. It probably feels like it was just because of the communities that I was in, but Breaking Bad felt close to me. Like there were a lot of people that were coming around for those like final two or three episodes. Those were hugely popular. Everybody online was talking about like the final few episodes. Um, the problem is I think Lost kind of started to fall off. So I don't know if, how many people I've heard that it kind of fell off. I don't know, but yeah, like the Breaking Bad ending was like, pretty hype throughout the entirety of the ending of that show. 